We'll, we'll go ahead and read. I'm going to read this whole chapter to you. So just to let you know, we're going to start in uh, chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm reading it out to King James because that's what we have. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly. It seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word changes us, Lord. When you anoint your word and your word goes forth with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, you, you said of it itself that it would not return to you void, but that you would cause it to accomplish that which you sent it forth to do, Lord. So tonight, Lord, as we begin to speak about love, I pray that you would help me as a vessel to speak forth your truth, that the love of God would come forth out of your word and into our hearts, Lord God. We yield ourselves to you. I yield myself to you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would use me as a vessel, Holy Spirit, to speak your love. I cannot do the love of Christ justice, Lord. So we need you to speak to us and give us revelation and understanding that we would understand the love of God and that it would be performed in our hearts. In Jesus name, we pray. Amen. Some of these verses that I put in my notes, I use the NASB version, but in that first verse, where it talked about the tongues of men and of angels, but if I do not have love, I become a noisy gong, is what the NASB says, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You know, I was thinking that maybe there's a distinction between a gong and a cymbal. Uh, a percussionist, a person that plays drums, will probably be able to tell the difference between a gong and a cymbal. But what I'm trying to say is, is this. Is that if you're just sitting there and you're banging on a gong or a cymbal, at some point in time, it's probably going to become quite irritating. The repetitive sound of a gonging or the banging of a cymbal at some point in time is going to, so it is with the believer. A believer that speaks forth the word of God, whether he be speaking it through prophecy some people would say, well, how can you speak in the spirit and still that it ends up being irritating? No, people sometimes, listen, the whole church of Corinth, let us remember this. When we read chapter 12 or studied chapter 12 and we studied chapter 14, one of the things that I believe with all my heart from the internal context is this, is that the people of God were operating in the gifts of the spirit, but they were doing it in such a way and how this happens, I don't know. They were doing it in such a way that, that they were taking, a, taking somebody else's word and they were, they were speaking over other people's words and they were cutting in because the Apostle Paul is having to correct so much of their behavior in the way that they're acting. And so the, the truth of the matter is, is this, because he said, listen, if somebody's given a word, he said, you need to give 
Three of you can give a word, but you need to do it one at a time. And then if somebody else is speaking and you get the word, then one person needs to stop and the other person needs to speak. He, why do you think he had to say that? Because that's what was going on. Because we already we came to this conclusion. I don't mean to reteach the whole thing, but I'm trying to make the point that they he had to bring correction into their into their lives. And we already know about the church that it was corn. We don't like to think that way. Sometimes whenever but he, Paul told us that the church was corn. He said, I should be able to feed you meat, but you're still, I need to give you milk. And, and, that, and that you're carnal because this person likes that preacher better than the next preacher. And listen, we all like certain preachers better than other preachers. I get that. But the reality of it is, is that we should all love the word of God and we should all love to hear the word of God. And especially we want the word of God to be anointed. But hallelujah, when the word of God goes forth, we should love the word of God. And so we see the internal evidence that that's what's going on. And so I'm just trying to make the point that when the word of God is going forth, that if the love of God is not interconnected to it, that it can, it starts to sound like a, a gong or a symbol. And it does not affect or cause the effect that God wants it to cause. Amen? Yeah, amen. If it's done without the love of God, it just doesn't sound right. But, but how do we, with that said, and I think that most of us would agree with that, how do we define God's love? In today's society. Maybe you don't agree with that. And it's okay. We can have different opinions. And, and that's okay. But but how would we, we would we define God's love in the day that we live in? Is the definition of what is the definition of God's love in in modern times? I mean, I'm just kind of more of a rhetorical question. I'm not asking. But if you want to shout it out, you can. Many people talk about love now. The church talks about love a lot. Y'all notice that? Have you, have you? If you pay attention to what other people are talking, a lot of people talk about love. A lot of the new songs talk about love. There's not always a real distinction about what they're talking about, but there's a general flavor of love, and people talk about love, right? But how do we define it? I was going to tell you a story about a youth pastor that preached and I'm going to tell you the story, but recently somebody shared something with me that they had posted something on a church Facebook page one time about Pride Week or about, about something having to do with, with the gay agenda and that they were asked to take it down because it didn't exhibit love. That That's just... That's that's just a fact that somebody told me that I didn't see the post. I don't know what it sounded like. I think I asked the person because I've seen I've seen pictures before where people go to these parades. And it's kind of weird to say it, but I'm, I kind of I didn't plan on saying it. But, you know, whenever I went to Bourbon Street with Lance and he was carrying a cross, he told people the truth. When people would come to him and they would say, but I love God. And he would say, well, then why are you sucking on that beer? Why don't you put the beer down, brother? If you know about the Lord, why don't you put the beer down? And why don't we repent right now? Why don't you get your heart right with God? But you would have never seen him with a, with a sign that says God hates da-da-da. You would have never seen him doing something like that. Because I can tell you, that's not the love of God. But what is the love of God? And so, so, is, so does that mean that the new movement in the church is that love never tells someone the truth? I can remember that youth pastor I was telling you about. This is many, many years ago before we started this church. And he was preaching on the Samaritan woman. And when he got to the part about how Jesus told her, this you say is true. You've had five husbands and the one that you're with now is not your husband. He said, I just don't believe that that's what Jesus was doing. I just don't believe that Jesus was calling out her sin. I feel like there's, or I don't know if he said exactly like calling out her sin, but he said, I just don't believe. I just, because I know that Jesus is like, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's exactly what he was doing. Because Jesus' love helps people. Amen. Whenever the truth is spoken and people receive the truth, the love of God helps people. Amen. Amen. So is the new definition of love that we never tell anyone that sin will destroy them? Do, do we never say homosexuality is wrong? Do we never say transgender, fornication, adultery, gossip, lying, slander, smoking, vaping, drugs, alcohol? Is it not love to tell the truth? 
So is it love to let people go to hell? No, no, I mean, if you really believe it. Now, you either believe it or you don't. You either believe that people that outside of Christ are, are going to go to hell, okay, or you don't believe that. Right. So is it is it okay to let them go to hell and they don't even know that what they're facing is going to be eternal judgment? I, I don't feel like it. Look what the word of God says. And you don't have to turn there. I'm just reading it to you. First Corinthians six, nine through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither are fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor effeminate. What is an what is now this is she turned there, that's the King James. And and, and the, it has the word effeminate there. The, and I'm reading out the NASB, but it has the word effeminate. And what is effeminate? It's when a man acts like a woman. It's when a man acts like a woman. So basically what we're seeing changing in society is men acting like women, women acting like men. But there's a bigger problem behind it. It's bigger than that they're just wearing. You understand what I'm saying? I don't mean to be old so technical, but it's bigger than that. They're just wearing a dress. There's a problem. They're actually degrading God's creation. They're saying that what God created people as is not good enough. And, and you get the point. Nor homosexuals. Nor that's what in the NASB it says, not the effeminate, not the homosexual, not thieves, not covetous, not drunkards, not revilers. It, the word reviler right there, it, it, the idea is, is that when you accuse someone of some, something or you insult someone in a malicious way, because that's not the love of God. Whenever we, when we accuse people of something or we insult someone uh, in a way that we're trying to be mean and, and we're just, and we're not caring enough to think about what it may do to them, that is not the love of God. Nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And I like this part. I love the way Paul says this. Such were some of you. Such were some of you, but you were washed. Hallelujah. Were is a past tense verb. You were washed. You were that, but you were washed. Amen. So you've been changed. You've been changed. I've been changed. It never ceases to amaze me how many times... In the life of a believer that they have come out of certain things in their lifestyle and the Lord has delivered them from various things. And yet sometimes we can become self-righteous in the way that we respond to people. And the love of God is not really being revealed in the way that we're treating people. You've seen that before. You've probably experienced it. I know I've done it myself before. But, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. It's true that sometimes I believe God's love is uncomfortable, but God's love heals and it restores. Amen. God so loved that he sent his son into a fallen world. How bad is the world church? It's so hostile towards God and his son. Do you suppose that, that, that what, a, what a love that in the face of hate and bitterness and jealousy and anger, as they wagged their head and shook their finger, and they said, save yourself, son of man. The world, religion, walked by the cross, laughed at him, mocked at him. And it's no different today. It's, it's bad today. There was a time whenever the Lord had respect. The Lord had reverence, especially in this nation. Amen. And I'm not saying that there's not still people that are open to hear him because I'll run into him every day. As a matter of fact, whenever I'm telling you right now that the enemy through the media through the, and I know y'all hear me say this a lot. The enemy through the media, through the music industry, through the news cycle, through various things is convincing the world that the world doesn't like Jesus. But every time I meet with people, unless they're just telling me what I want to hear. Right, right. I mean, I guess that's possible. But every time I meet with people, it's, at least it's on a daily basis. Well, if I'm, if I'm outside in the world in the sense that I'm at a clinic somewhere or whatever the case, I promise you I have at least one conversation a day, an in-depth conversation with the condition of the world and the condition of people's hearts and about Jesus. Not just about God. No, I, his name. I say his name multiple times. And I can promise you that I very seldom see people completely turn me off. So I don't think that people are as against the Lord as what we're, they're trying to convince right. us that people right. are against That's the Lord. True. Amen. 
And I think that we need to be reminded of that. That people, there is hope for folk. Amen. Amen. There's hope for people, hallelujah, if the love of God would grab a hold of them. But they wagged their hand, they cast it in his teeth, said, save yourself. And his response was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. That's the love of God. That's right. Jesus manifests the love of God right there on the cross. Amen. I mean, the cross by itself is a display of God's love. But to see the heart of Jesus when people are treating him the worst. Now, I don't know about you, but usually the Lord, after a little bit of time, I'll spend some time in his presence. He'll get a hold of my heart. But sometimes right at the brink of the offense, I ain't like necessarily feeling it the way Jesus was feeling it when he was hanging on the cross. But I thank the Lord that my heart is still sensitive enough that when I go into prayer, when I seek his face, he begins to deal with me and he begins to show me. I mean, do you know what I'm talking about, church? Yes. yes. I know we're tired, but praise God. I know you have to know what I'm talking about because I know that people do the same things to you. Yes. Your own family, your friends, the people that you work with sometimes. I know that sometimes people come against you and they say things to you that are offensive and it hurts you. I mean, some of you may be able to handle offenses and hurts better than others. Some people, it really jams them up. Like, really, it'll, it'll jam you up if you're not careful. But the answer is to get along with the Lord. The answer is to let God bathe you in His love. Yes. The answer is to get along with the Lord, to spend time in prayer, to worship Him, let His presence enter your atmosphere, and let your atmosphere be changed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Good news, Jesus died on the cross so you could enter in through a torn veil and you could enter into the presence of the Lord and He can bring healing. Hallelujah. What a good God we serve. That's the love of Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Father, forgive them. It's not pretty clean, romantic kind of love, my friend. It's heartbreak breaking. It exposes. It convicts of wrong. But this love is so full of passion. Selflessness, sacrifice, it's unforgettable. Yet so many that have been touched by his love at one point in time don't continue to carry on in change. And then when you're talking about change, people are like, don't start talking about change, preacher, because I don't like change. But he died so that we could change. Yes. Did he not? He died so that we could change. As a matter of fact, you know, I love the words of John the Baptist. I quote it all the time. He says, I must decrease so that he might increase. When the crucifixion of my flesh starts to take place, when I allow myself to be yielded to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will reveal to me when I'm not operating in love, when I'm operating in self, when I'm operating in the old man, the, and the Holy Spirit, does, he wants to do surgery. Yes. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Amen. What kind of love is this that Jesus showed? You know, I was thinking, it just entered into my, I was praying whenever the Lord dropped the word love. I was, I, I don't know, the last time I worked in New Iberia, I was praying, I guess it was Monday. And the Lord just dropped the word love in my heart like that. And I knew that that's what he wanted me to preach. And then I knew that he wanted me to preach on chapter 13. But then he just started speaking to me about little things. And I don't know that I would have ever really put this story in here about love. But the Lord put it on my heart whenever I was writing it. And so I'm going to remind you about Numbers chapter 21. Because this is the... Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Yes. And the Lord dropped that in my spirit right along with all this other love information that he was given. And, and you know, one of the things when you remember that story, we have to remember that it all started with murmuring and complaining. The opposite of God's peace. He poured out his love. He allowed the blood to be painted on the doorposts and the side posts. He led his people out of Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea. He promised to provide manna for them. And his people, called by his name, began to murmur and complain. Yeah. Talking about Moses. I read it again today. Talking about Moses and God murmuring and complaining. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, Serpents after serpents that begin to bite them, poison as serpents, uh, poison asps, serpents that are biting the people of God and poisoning them. 
and causing many to die. Listen to me, child of God. New Testament theology, I would say that's a type of bitterness right there. That's the poison of the enemy. That's the poison of the snake. He's injecting bitterness, hatred, frustration, irritation into the hearts and lives of God's people. Trying to make them feel like, oh, God, you've left me. And the offenses always come from someone else. Yeah. Usually they come from someone else. Like Sabrina was saying, it's, yes, there's a spirit behind it. But until we start to get a revelation and we realize that we have a tendency to focus on the human being. Yeah. Right. But the Lord, in the midst of that, gives healing. He promises healing and his healing is love. And he says, put that serpent on that pole, lift it up, and if the people will look to it, they will be healed. Yes. Many times people's physical infirmities in their body is a direct result of the bitterness, Amen. the anger, and the frustration. Right. Various types of sin that they have allowed to come into their heart and in their lives. Right. But God wants to heal them. And just as they looked at the serpent on the pole, because what did God do there? He judged the sin of the serpent on that pole. Jesus did not turn into sin on that pole. Jesus is the sin offering. He's judging the serpent sin. Jesus judged sin on the cross. He judged your sin on the cross. You can be free from the power of sin. He wants to heal you, though, of your disease. Hallelujah. He wants to heal you of what? And physical healing is in the cross. Emotional healing is in the cross. I believe that. Do we believe it? Have we believed it enough? Probably not. But we need to believe it more. Yes. We need to believe in the healing power of the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Physical, emotional, spiritual healing. Yes. Listen to me. Jesus has done it. Yes. He's full of love. And the enemy is coming in. He's coming in. And he's going to try to get us off a of course. He's going to try to get us to rebel against God. He's going to try to get us to murmur and complain, right? I mean, come on, somebody. Yes. True. And Lord knows Pastor Matt's done enough of his murmur and complaining too. Come on. When the preacher preaches to the congregation, just let me be known, he's preaching to himself. Yeah. I don't want to keep falling short to them old tricky tricks. Yeah. It, 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 his stuff is lame. I'm done. I don't want to keep on falling into the same old trap yes. and allowing myself to walk around like a novice in this Christian faith. And then they, I, you know, by now we ought to be able to tell, you know what? I'm just, I, this just hit my head. Them leaves don't look right right there. You ever been in the woods? I'm not much of a hunt. I was never a hunter, but I've been in the woods a couple of times. And I don't really know. I've never set traps before, but I know that people set them. And it seems like if you've been in the woods a few times, hopefully, you might be, oh, right. I'm an expert trapper. And the way them leaves are set up right now, I don't think that I'll even put my foot right in there because I'm going to get myself snared. And at some point in time, spiritually speaking, as we mature into the things of God, as we mature according to the word of God, we should begin to learn and to be able to assess whenever the enemy is starting to have his way in our heart and in our mind. If we spend too much time thinking about the attacks of Satan and the result of it, and we start to get frustrated with the human beings that are behind that, and we allow bitterness to come in and irritation to come in, we're going to miss the whole point, right, of what God is desiring to do. Because, look, I was talking to, well, I talked to a couple people today. And you know what's amazing is that's one, one good thing about being a pastor is that when you get to talk to a couple of people, what's amazing is you hear this person might be going through this, this person might be going through this, but actually whenever we become more mature in the faith, we start to realize they both, they both said, man, but God's going to do something. Even though there seems to be stuff that's shaking and rattling and rolling and it might seem like it's negativity, the reality of it is, is that we should expect that when the Holy Spirit starts moving in people's lives, that the enemy, it's like, he, yeah, I, I don't recommend it. I don't think I've ever done it. I don't recommend that you go poke a hornet's nest. Yeah. But spiritually speaking, if that's what it means to cry out to God yeah. 
If it means to cry out to God with everything that is in you and to exalt the king, if that's what you call poking a spiritual hornet's nest, then I recommend that you do it. I recommend that you do it because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And Jesus is worthy of glory and honor. And even though the hornets might be flying around and stuff might start happening in the midst of that, in your personal life and also in the church world, in this very church right here, God wants to do something. God wants to teach you and I about his love. He wants to teach us about his love. He wants to teach us about how his love can enter in and change our hearts and change our situations and our circumstances. Amen. Sometimes we don't even see that there's various things operating in our own lives until the Lord allows things to be stirred up. And so when things get stirred up, the mature response according to the word of God is this. It's a simple version. We yield ourselves to what the Holy Spirit is saying because we know and we'll see in this love chapter that there's certain elements that the word of God describes as love. Amen. In John 1 12, he said, but as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. You know, I was thinking children reflect the image of their father. True children of God are molded into the image of his son and his son is the image of the invisible God. That's all straight out your, out your Bible. Amen. True children of God are molded into the image of his son. And his son is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1, 5, 15. God is love. 1 John 4, 7 through 9. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Amen. When the sacrificial love of Jesus enters inside of our heart, it changes everything. Because the revelation of his love changes everything. Lost and hopeless humanity was stuck in a world of darkness. One person I talked to today, I was thinking, you know, and I'll put it in my notes. We have such a little small snapshot of humanity. And what I mean is most of us don't study into history too much because even I'm a person that has looked into history some, but, but we still have a tendency to focus very much on our own little snapshot of life, right? Does that make sense? Because I mean, we're more focused on, on us and our world and what affects us. This is not a reality of the, the bigger picture of human history, what you and I have been born into. What I'm saying is you and I have been born into this country called the United States of America. What I'm saying is you and I have been born into this country after Jesus had already died on the cross and ascended into heaven, prayed to the Father that he would send the Comforter. And the Comforter has been on this earth for over 2,000 years now. And the Comforter has been doing a work and this country has been full of light and you and I happen to be birthed into this moment in history. But I can tell you something right now. Before Jesus showed up on the scene, my friend, this world was so full of darkness, so full of darkness and, and needed love so bad, needed the love of God so bad. Amen. And if we could really understand the light of his love, the transformation power of the love of God, we would so appreciate the Lord more. I'm not saying we don't appreciate him, but I believe we would appreciate him even more. Without Jesus, there's only sickness, sin, disease, darkness, and trouble. Nothing but hopelessness. We were without him, yet he loved us in spite of ourselves. The word of God says he still loved us. He showed us his love. NASB says he demonstrated his love. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. When did he die for you? I would say he died for you when you were wor your worst. While you were in sin, he died for you. What, what, what was the worst? Was it when you were knee deep in sex, drugs, and rock and roll? I just used that. You know, sexual sin, 
drugs, alcohol, or was it after he saved you and you might have cheated on him again? Yeah, amen. That's right. You can figure that one out between you and God and he and I will figure my story out. But that's a good question. When is the worst? It doesn't matter. When was the worst? The Lord knows and he'll reveal it to you. But what, what really matters is this, is that you're forgiven. Yeah. What really matters is that you're forgiven and you're made righteous because of the love of God, which was manifest in Christ. Hallelujah. And he's proven his love. Amen. Selfless, sacrificial, relentless, a pursuing love that will not quit. God's love will not quit. Have you ever tried to run from him, Christian? Yeah. Yes. People have tried to run from the Lord. And they, I guarantee you, if you talk to them, they will say to you, you're not going to outrun the Lord. Right. And he's got you. He's got a hook in you. Oh, you might try to ignore it, but you will not outrun the love of the Lord. Right. Yeah. Refuses to give up. Yes, thank God. Hallelujah. Yeah. He will not give up on you, child of God. Please let us agree together here tonight. Holy Spirit, we never want to give up on the Lord. Holy Spirit. Spirit, we need you. Holy, that's I've been saying that lately. I read in a book, that prayer book I've been reading, and I thought that was so interesting. I need to look into it a little bit more, but it was so profound. He said, Jesus is your advocate. The Holy Spirit is the advocate of Jesus. Mm -hmm. No, hold on. Jesus said he will take up with his mind and he will show it unto you. The ministry of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is to help the disciples to see Jesus. Yes. That's why I've been praying lately. I'm like, Holy Spirit, we got to have you. Yes. we got to have you in our services. I ain't worried about no spirit of Jezebel. I'm worried about the Holy Spirit. He's stronger than the spirit of Jezebel. And if you don't show up, Lord, we will not be able to worship the king, to give him glory, to give him honor like he deserves to be worshipped. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen? I need his help. You need his help. Do you not need his help? I need his help. Yes. Hallelujah. Unless that love is in our hearts and manifesting the fruit produced from the Holy Spirit in our lives, you can have all the gifts you want. Mm -hmm. You will still be a gong or a clinging symbol. Mm, yes. You can have faith to move mountains. You don't have love. You don't have anything. Right. You can give all your money to feed the poor. No love. Nothing. Visual manifestations of love. It suffers long. It's patient. It's kind. It means it's useful. I'm not looking for a pat on the back. That's the first time I think I've ever done this since I've loved the Lord, since I've been on fire for God. I don't know why. I didn't say anything about Jesus, but I did. I did say something to Jesus about Jesus to somebody else that day. But I was jogging down Main Street in Patterson. I don't know. It might have been Saturday. Came to the church to pray. Felt like jogging. Jogging down Main Street in Patterson. Some guy pulls up with a trailer. He's moving some stuff. Got a blanket over it. And I'm thinking, mm, that's probably not going to work good. Sure enough, up the road, some of his stuff had fallen out. And I was on the other side of the road. And all of a sudden, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, go help him pick that stuff up. So I jogged over there. I heard him picked it up. I said, hey, bro, have a good day. I didn't even say nothing about the Lord. The Lord, I didn't, I'm not saying that the Lord didn't want me to. I didn't feel impressed to say anything about the Lord. But you know what? As I was jogging away, I was like, you know what? Sometimes just doing something nice. Now, I'm not changing the doctrine on you here, my friend. I believe in doing nice things and telling people about Jesus. Let us not be confused about what the preacher just said. I believe that the Buddhists can do nice things and never talk about Jesus. If they don't know why we did the nice thing, I'm just saying that's the one time in my life in the last 30 years or so, or however long it's been, that I can remember doing something nice for somebody and not saying, but being kind is the love of of God manifest in your life. And you know what that means when you look it up? It means to be useful. Yes. God wants you and I to be useful That's good. for the kingdom of God. He wants his love to enter in and to flow out of us. Amen. It's not jealous. It's not full of envy. God's love doesn't look like that. I'm happy. You know, it, it may look something like this. I'm happy God is using you, brother. Sister, I'm so happy God is using you. I'm thankful to God that he's blessing you. I was praying for you while you were going through that spot in your life. It is good to see that he pulled you through. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. That's, that's kindness. That's, that's uh, you know, God not being jealous, not being envious. There have been times in my life, I hate to admit this to you. Then when I see God using somebody and I feel like he wasn't using me as much, I would start to get 
something jacked up in my heart. Or the thought even runs through my mind. That's that's not good. But but anyway, it happens to us. I'm not trying to get you break bear, break you down. I'm trying to make a point. It does happen, but it's a symptom that it's a problem. Yes. It's a symptom that it's a problem in our heart and in our lives when we should really be thankful that God is using people. Hallelujah. That, you know, there was a period of time in their life that they might have been dry, that they might have been. And then all of a sudden, if all of a sudden somebody that was dry is now full of fire and they're, and they're singing Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. We should be happy for that. Oh, but they're a little bit too wild. A little bit too much fire. I don't know how to figure this out. Well, the Holy Spirit will figure it out. And we learn to love them and to learn how to accept them. I'm preaching to myself right now, my friend. Let the Holy Spirit have his work. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. Amen. Praise God. It's not easily provoked. Man, you really hurt me. I don't really understand why you did that. But this is what first this is what 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 says. For the love of Christ constraineth us. The word in some of the other uh, translations says com compels us. The word constraineth in the Greek. Okay, some of you older people, y'all remember that Who concert a long time ago when all those people died? Y'all remember that? Yes. The Who, they were crushed. The Guess Who. Yeah, yeah there you go. So it was, the, it was Who? The Guess Who. The Guess Who. Okay, that must have been a different version of The Who. No. no. Okay. <laughs> anyway. I thought some people got trampled at the hookah. They did. Okay. Anyway, there have been literally people. <laughs> if you ever got a trivial question, so I got it. No, I mean, that's a good thing. But listen. I think, this, I think you're okay. right also. Yeah. I, you think I'm right also? Okay. The point is, is this. Is that sometimes in big crowds of people, it has, it has literally been said. But I think this happened at that thing at Ashford. That the crowd started to press on people and they said that they literally their feet weren't on the ground anymore. Yeah. And as the crowd moved, they were moved. That's what that word literally means. Constraining. It's like you it's like you're being pressed into a tight spot and you're being moved. He's saying that the love he what he said, for the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ wraps us up. And picks us up and moves us into the direction that he desires for us to go. Yes. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say this. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We're not living for ourselves anymore. The love of Christ Constrain it to me. You hurt me, but you can't really hurt a dead man, right? How are you going to hurt a dead man? If he's dead in Christ and resurrected to newness of life, you might have hurt me, but if Jesus can find the love within him to exhibit to those that mocked him and treated him so horribly as he hung on the cross, laughing and scoffing in his face, but come to the point where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Think about that. That's a powerful part. We can say, Father, forgive them. But what about the next part? For they know not what they do. That goes along kind of with what Sabrina was saying. Sometimes people don't really even know what they're operating in. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. You know, the word of God says in the book of Romans chapter one towards the end. It talks about homosexuality. It talks. It says this. It says that when people, when the gospel is suppressed, rejected, when evil men, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them which believe. And it says evil men suppress the truth. And when they do, there's a spiraling down of the judgment of God that starts to take place. The spiraling down results in God giving people over to a reprobate mind. 
in their vain imaginations, they start off with worshiping false gods instead of worshiping the, worshiping the God of creation. Right. Even though they know in their heart that what they're doing is wrong. And then the end result of that is this, is that as he gives them over for a reprobate mind, they start to actually, a woman uses a woman for the wrong purpose. A man uses a man for the wrong purpose. And that it, and that it continues to spiral even further. And then in the end, it says that they are going to face judgment. But then it says this, not only them, but those basically that agree with what it is that they're doing. Uh -huh. it says it. You need to go back and read it. I'll paraphrase it, but that's exactly what it says. Have you ever noticed before how if you scroll through Facebook, you will see. And listen, I'm not here. I don't scroll through Facebook anymore. It's been a long time since Danielle's really told me a whole lot about what's on Facebook. But there have been times before that I remember her saying, I just can't, I don't understand. You know, people put something about, you know, I have a right to love too and da, da, da. And then the Christian, what people that go to church, let's put it that way. Bing, 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 bing. Like, thumbs up, emojis are going off. Heart things are going on. And, and, and it's like, they, do they even understand the, the word of God? Do, have they been told the word of God? Or, or, or are we in the midst of a church, a church world, that now the definition of the love of God is that you don't tell people the truth anymore, even though it's written in the word of God. I realize that I lose people whenever I say that. But I want to love people and I want to love God more than I, than I love myself or whatever I think that I'm doing, right? So love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love rejoices in truth, not lies. Amen? Amen. Prophecies will fail. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will vanish away. Why? Because there's coming a day when those things will no longer be. We need them now. We need prophecy. We need tongues with interpretation. However, we need the knowledge of God intermingled with love because knowledge without love puffs up. There's coming a day when those things will no longer be needed because all those things are currently simply tools used by God for the purpose of revealing himself to a world that is sick with sin and full of hate towards God. But one day... Love will come. Hallelujah. One day love will come and that which is perfect will come. And when he comes, the fulfillment of God's plan has a name. Jesus. Okay. Jesus is his name. When the manifestation of God's love returns to this earth, the part will be done away with. See, right now love is only partly seen. It can only be partly seen by others through us. It's sad that the world out there is hurting so badly and in need of his love so much. They are drowning in hate and sin and his own people called by his name struggle to love one another. Don't, don't we? Sometimes we struggle to love one another. Yeah. Scripture says, he that loveth his brother abides in the light and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. We must always be on guard, but while men slap, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and then went his way. But Jesus said, don't pluck up the tares. Because in plucking up the tares, we could damage the wheat that is around the tares. You know, I used to, I studied about tares a long time ago. And from what I remember, interesting thing about a tear is when it first starts to sprout up, it looks exactly like wheat. Matter of fact, you don't even know that a tear is a tear until right there when it's time for harvest. It's like the head of the, the, what looks like the grain is a different color than the rest. So you can literally see over waving fields of grain. And you, if you're a good farmer, you could probably pick out the tears. But you can't, probably the reason why I'm assuming that you can't just go plucking up tears is because they're interconnected in the root system, right? And tears are poisonous. Tears are poisonous. But you know, sometimes something that might look like a tear might not really be a tear. I mean, in other words, they're sitting in your church. 
they're doing whatever they're doing. It seems like they're a tear. You believe they're a tear. You want to believe they're a tear. The enemy's telling you they're a tear, but they may not be a tear. They might be a believer that needs the love of Christ to minister to their heart. They might be a believer that needs to be accepted by the body of Christ. They might be a believer that if they just put their nose in the word of God and the Holy Spirit ministers to them and other people love them, that the next thing you know, they might be one of the strongest pieces of weed you ever saw. Right. Amen. That's good. That's good. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I was thinking about this too. In chapter 12 of, you can turn there for me, uh, Haley, if you don't mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then verse 18. I don't think I have a lot more to go, so y'all just bear with me. But in this verse, I, was, I went back and I read the chapter before and after again. And I thought this was interesting because actually you don't, you don't have to change. I'm just going to read starting in verse 14, but I'm just, I want to focus on 18 so you can leave that one up on the screen. But it says the body is not one member but many. And the foot says, because I'm not the hand and I'm not the body, it's still the body, right? If the ear says, because I'm not the eye, I'm not the body, but it's still really the body. You can't say that. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But then it says this. I thought this was so interesting. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. You see that? Now God set the members... Every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. And one of the things that the Lord spoke to me in prayer a long time ago, and that I've mentioned to y'all many times, is that what the Holy Spirit said was, son, I need you to, I understand what you were trying to do. He was more gracious to me than what I was, than I explained it to y'all. He said, I understand what you were trying to do, but what you were trying to do, you weren't getting done. Okay, so I need you to move out the way because what did he said, I want to work in my body so I can work through my body. Now, what this tells me in this passage of scripture is that not everybody all the time is going to prophesy. Not everybody all the time is going to give a word in tongues. Not everybody all the time is going to give an interpretation of a tongue. Not everybody's going to be a musician. Not everybody's going to be an intercessory prayer warrior. Not everybody is going to have the faith to operate and lay on of hands and seeing people healed right then and there. It doesn't mean that people can't grow in that. It doesn't mean that we can't begin to believe the word of God for the way that it's written and that the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, will start to move upon us. And I mean, it happened to me the other day at the clinic. Some lady came in with a hurt arm. And I, I ordered all the stuff. Uh, and, and she just kept saying she was in pain. I just hurt so much. I did everything I knew to do. I was being a good little Lord. I said, ma'am, do you believe in the power of prayer? Yes, I do. Well, hallelujah, let's pray. Amen. And I prayed and she kind of looked at me after I said the name of Jesus. But I said, praise God. Be blessed. And they, they said they were going to call her up. They, 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 they called her up. When I went back to work. I said, did she come back for her recheck? No, she didn't. She didn't answer the phone. I don't know what that means, but I know this. I prayed the prayer of faith. I prayed the prayer of faith. I prayed it in the name of Jesus. I asked first, do you believe in the power of prayer? I believe that woman didn't need to answer the phone. Hallelujah. I want to believe that she got it. Praise God. That's his job, my friend. It's his job to do the healing. It's my job to believe in a supernatural miracle working God. Yes. Praise God. That's good. While men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat. Don't pluck up the tares. You know why? Because, see, the wheat might get damaged and the wheat is so precious to the Lord. Yes. You got to be careful, Christian. We got to be careful. So precious to our Lord for the wheat or the very souls that he purchased with his blood. You know, I, was, I remember <coughs> a story that Aaron told me. And one thing I prayed, I prayed this morning while I was in bed. This might be a weird prayer, but I was like, Father, thank you so much for my mind, for my memory. Yes. Lord, please don't let me ever lose this memory. Let my memory be like my mom's. Let my mind and my memory be like my mom's. Because I'm telling you, stuff will flood into my mind from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. And, and now it's all like illustrative sermons every time it enters my mind. I can remember probably 15 years ago, Aaron told me a story. 
And I thought he might be here tonight. I was going to verify, but I'm pretty sure he said it was Polycarp. I don't know if you've ever heard of Polycarp. You probably haven't, but Polycarp was one of John's disciples. That may not mean much to you, but you imagine sitting under the ministry of John the Apostle. After Jesus, now this would have been after he was released from the Isle of Patmos, after he had received the Revelation vision. And Polycarp states in some of the church father writings that towards the end of John's life, they would bring the old man outside because they had church outside and they'd kind of prop him up against the tree. And he would say, with tears streaming down his face, Master told us to love one another. And that was basically all he said. And they would just sit there and tears would stream down their face. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Master said for us to love one another. Oh, hallelujah, saints. There's power. Wonder work and power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I want my heart to be soft like that. Praise God. Can you imagine that? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You know, we think about the Apostle Paul. But, I mean, think about John, man. The, the apostle that Jesus loved. He, he walked with him. He's the one that had his head on his, right there on his chest. Man. The master told us to love one another. Oh. Why do you think he said that? I wonder, I wonder why... I mean, I can't re reenact the scene because I wasn't there, so I don't really know why. But I can't, just like I see whenever Paul says, don't cut in on your brother, or if he starts to talk, then you should be quiet over here and let him talk. It makes me believe that that was going on and that that's why the correction had to be brought. But it makes me wonder, and I can't prove it, if John would just keep saying the same thing when they walked him out, <laughs> prop him up against the tree, and tears would stream down his face, and he'd say, the master said that we should love one another. And just keep saying that. It makes you wonder if they weren't loving one another. I mean, it kind of makes me think that. Why else would he keep preaching the same sermon? I'm not going to change it. But you already said that, preacher. You said that five. Yeah, sure did. You already prayed that, preacher. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think you keep praying it? Because we still need him to do it. Yes, we right. still need him to do it. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's the revelation, the manifestation of God's love. Love manifested on the earth in the form of his son. Now him being ascended, the great comforter has descended. And the great love has entered our hearts. Amen? Amen. Through the person of the spirit. The revelation is that it's not about my gift being greater than the next person. My tongue, my interpretation being more important than the next person. It's never about me. It's always about him. That's why I cannot afford to be provoked. That's why I cannot afford to be envious. I cannot afford to be seeking my own or full of jealousy. That's why I have to embrace truth and not lies. That's why I would rather patiently bear with you. And the meaning of that word means to not expose your sin. I, would, I must bear patiently with you rather than display your sin in front of the whole world. There's some Christians that are chomping at the bit, ready to find dirt on you so they can expose your sin. But the word of Proverbs says in 17 and 9, He who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. Oh, hallelujah. The Holy Spirit don't want you talking about everybody's mess out in the street. That's right. The love of Jesus constrained you yes. to show love like he showed you. Yes. That is why I have to endure all things, which means not to recede. <laughs> I was thinking about this because when I look the word up, when it says part of it means to endure one of the things I studied was one of the words I clicked on said recession or to recede from something. And I was thinking that we got some couple people in the church that work in a dental office. I don't know a lot about dentistry, but I do know this. I remember my sister, I said, 
Well, Debbie, because she used to work for a dentist. And I'm like, I mean, do you have, is it important to floss? She said, well, man, I'm just gonna tell you what Dr. Barletta told us. Some, a patient I asked one time, this is an illustration. I'm not trying to like pump you up to floss. You do what you want with your teeth. <laughs> but I said, is it important to floss? She said, I'm gonna tell you what Dr. Barletta told us. A patient asked one time, do I have to floss all my teeth? He said, just the ones you wanna keep. <laughs> <laughs> So recession is kind of like erosion, right? It, I mean, is that, let me ask you this. You that work in a dental office, would not recession of the gums ultimately reveal the roots at some point in time? Yes. Erosion on soil will ultimately reveal the root system. Boy, if you've got a root system in Christ that the gospel of Jesus Christ has entered into your heart, and if you're not careful, Start to erode that, re reveal the roots, start dealing with the roots, start dealing with the foundation of our walk. Lord, help us. Revelation 3, 2 says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. All right, singers, musicians, you can come forward. Don't let it erode. Don't let it recede. Anything else other than the love of God being manifest in my life is me acting like a child. He said, when I was a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but now I have love. I have the love of the Father and the heart of God. And in Christ, I have made a mature man or woman of God. I no longer act like a child or act like you take my toy. Now I take yours. You be mean to me. I be mean to you. No, I learned to allow my old man to die and allow God's love to live through me. The love of God made me a man. And when I became a man, I put away childish things. I didn't preach chapter 14, but verse 1 says, pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts. Crave them. Cry out for them. But pursue Hotly pursue love. Hallelujah. Let's worship the King. Let's praise Him. Let's thank Him.